Well, this evening, we'll, we'll move now out of the realm of false worldviews that, that seek to use the Bible. That's, that's all the worldviews that we've been looking at thus far. These are, those are worldviews that seek to still use God's Word, but to pervert it uh, and are essentially how you would define what a cult is. They, they move out of the realm of Orthodox Christianity, and they have perverted who God is or perverted what salvation is, which I really think, I think most of them that we've looked at just pervert both. Um, but we're moving out of that realm, and we're now going to move into a look at some that don't. Uh, as I said before this evening, we're going to begin with Buddhism. Uh, and, and I will say that we are just looking at really the core tenets of this. Uh, there are different variations of thought, just as there are really different variations of thought within every faith you'll look at. Uh, there are different variations of thought within Buddhism. So... As always, I would encourage you to hear from the person you're talking to in order to figure out what they specifically believe. If you meet someone that is a Buddhist, you want to hear from their own mouth uh, what they believe in order that you can uh, then rightly combat, uh, combat what they believe the truth. But looking at what we will uh, be, be doing so this evening should at least give you a good groundwork of understanding what is going on in the mind of a Buddhist uh, as pertaining to how they're viewing the world and what their goal is in life, and what you know, why are they living life the way that they are? Uh, for example, we live our life to the glory of God, to love God and love neighbor. Uh, we're, we're at least going to get the groundwork of how they're viewing the world, what are they doing, what is their purpose, and why are they doing what they're doing? Why are they living the way that they're living, and so forth? Uh, and to begin with some of the history, uh, Buddhism began around the fifth century BC which is, so that would be the, the 600s B.C., with a man named Siddhartha Gautama. Does anybody want me to spell that? No? Okay. I mean, I can if you're taking notes. That's almost, you know, I wasn't making a joke. I was just saying. Uh, so his name is Siddhartha Gautama, who later became uh, to be known as the Buddha. Uh, he was an Indian prince who lived in an area that is today uh, northern India or Nepal, and according to legend, shortly after his birth, a, a sage or a prophet uh, prophesied that uh, Siddhartha would become either a powerful king or a great spiritual leader. So it was prophesied at his birth that he would either grow up to be a great king or a great spiritual leader. And because his father desired for him to be the powerful king and not the, the spiritual leader, he didn't want his son to, to have anything to do with religion whatsoever, uh, his father kept him inside the palace, showering him with every luxury and privilege, and sheltering him from the harsh realities of the outside world. Uh, well, during this time, he, he married, he had a son, uh, but he, came, he became extremely dissatisfied, uh, obviously. He was just, all he knew was palace life and luxury, uh, and that happened up until the age 29. So at the age of 29, Siddhartha began to venture out beyond the palace gates uh, on a series of chariot rides that would change the course of his life. Uh, on the first trip, he saw a sick man. And this kind of escalates, uh, as, as the legend goes. On the first trip, he saw a sick man. On the second, he saw an old man. And on the third trip, he saw a corpse. He saw a dead body for the first time in his life. He'd never seen death before as his, in his time being sheltered in, in the palace. Uh, these were his first encounters with the uh, inevitable suffering experienced by all human beings. Uh, no matter how successful you were, Siddhartha saw that, that all grow old and all experience suffering in this world. And that knowledge was devastating to him. He, he, he didn't know this before, and that knowledge really devastated him. Uh, then on a fourth chariot ride, uh, Mr. Gautama saw a beggar who was at the same time still peaceful and content. So here's a beggar who's living in the outside world. He knows that suffering goes on, but yet he's still peaceful and he's still uh, content. And as this man was a religious man, he was a spiritual seeker of some sort, uh, Siddhartha had a revelation. Uh, if this beggar is, is living in this world of suffering and he still has peace, then there must be a way out of suffering and his revelation was that that was through the religious life in some form or fashion. So 
in an act that is called the Great Renunciation uh, amongst Buddhists, he ended up leaving the palace. He, he left his family, uh, father, mother. He left his wife. He left his kid. Uh, and he left to set out on this journey to find the answer to escaping suffering. He went out to find, how do I escape the suffering that is inevitable in this world? So at first he joined a Hindu ascetic group, ascetic group and uh, participated in severe asceticism. Uh, asceticism is just severe, uh, treating your body in a severe way to obtain holiness. So uh, he participated in the beating of self. He participated in prolonged meditation. And as legend would have it, for some time, he subjected himself to eating one grain of rice a day. So you can imagine, I mean, that is, that is severe asceticism. I mean, one grain of rice a day, you're, you're not feeling full at all. You're just you're feeling hunger all day. Uh, he did this in order to seek enlightenment or to escape from suffering. And uh, after a time of doing this, you can imagine that he almost died. And it was at this point that he was enlightened to the truth of what is called uh, the middle way. The middle way, we'll mention it later, it's also called the Eightfold Path. Um, but he was enlightened to the truth of the middle way, uh, that what we must do in this life is to stay in between asceticism and, and pleasure. But that's how we escape suffering ultimately, is by staying on this path that I'll bring up here later. But it's, it's staying in between asceticism and, and, and pleasure. Uh, he ended up meditating under what is called a Bodhi tree. And after 49 days of doing so, he had a series of insights into the nature of reality and became ultimately enlightened. Uh, and for the next 45 years, he was known as the Buddha. That word literally means the awakened one. So he, was, he is the, the enlightened one, the awakened one. He is the Buddha uh, as he went and taught the path to liberation, to freedom from suffering that he had realized. Well, uh, Buddhism is now the fourth largest religion in the world, it has around 350 million worldwide practicing, and the closest Buddhist temples, I believe, are in Dallas, with several uh, being over in that way. So, I have three tenets this evening to really cover what is taught within Buddhism. And the first is that they have a, what is called a monistic worldview, M-O-N-I-S-T-I-C, they have a monistic worldview, meaning they don't believe that there is a distinction between anything in the creation at all. Uh, they believe that everything has the same substance and reality. Everything in this creation is, is one. There is no distinction in anything. So the prefix mon or mono means one. As we are monotheistic as Christians, we believe in one God. We're monotheistic. Um, but we are not monistic in our view of reality because we understand that there are distinctions in the world that we live in. There is a distinction between creator and creation. And even in that, the creator has, has placed distinction within the creations itself. For example, me and you are not of the same substance in that sense. We have individual souls. We're not the same person. Uh, we will individually stand before God and, and have to give an account for what we individually did. Uh, I'm not a tree. I'm, I'm not of the same substance as a rock and so forth. There are, there are distinctions. I'm just, I'm, just, yeah. I'm just saying that because this is different from their worldview. Um, everything in a monistic worldview is the same. It's all of the same uh, substance. Um, everything has the same reality. And within this thought in Buddhism, you will find that they are either atheistic, not believing in, in a god at all, or they are pantheistic, and pantheistic means that everything is God. Uh, the rock is God, the tree is God, I'm God, I, we're all a manifestation of, of God. All of reality is, is God. Uh, everything is a manifestation of this, of this God reality. So it's, it's really a view of an impersonal God. We believe in a personal God. God speaks to us. He reveals himself to us. Uh, he gives us his word of, of Pantheistic view of God is an impersonal view of God. It's just this force kind of thing. It's all of it's all of reality is a manifestation of God. So there is no supreme creator in this in this worldview, uh, and you can see how both of those spectrums work in their in their monism. Uh, because if you're an atheist and there is no supreme creator, then of course everything is the same. 
Everything is just matter. Everything's all made of the same substance. Uh, some uh, manifestations of this matter are, are just more, more grown or more well equipped to establish themselves in this world. But we are in atheism, you know, we're, we're more established, you could say, because our, our uh, matter has grown into, hey, we have minds, we can do things, and so forth like that. We're not like grass that just sits there or, or a tree and so forth. Um, but essentially in that worldview, we are all of the same substance. Everything is the same. Uh, and if you're a pantheist and everything is God, well then, again, of course everything is the same. Everything is a manifestation of God. So they're either going to be atheistic or pantheistic in this. And, and I did find it interesting. If, if, you're a, uh, if you're a fan of Star Wars, I mentioned this to Dawson uh, before, but George Lucas, the creator of Star Wars, is a Buddhist. Uh, and, and is a pantheist. And you can see how that plays out in Star Wars with the Force. Because the Force is really all one. And there's either there's the good side of the Force or there's the dark side of the Force. But there really is no distinction because it all comes from the same Force. It all comes from one. It's all one reality. It's a monistic worldview. Uh, so that's the first tenet. Uh, we're all a part of this one reality in, crea in creation, which... Uh, would mean that there's really nothing overtly special about us as humans um, over against anything else in creation because we're just all a part of the same substance. You know, again, they're, they're, we're just a different manifestation of the same thing. Secondly, we have uh, what is called within Buddhism, so I'm going to the second tenet, we have what is called the Four Noble Truths. The Four Noble Truths. And, and these Four Noble Truths are really at the heart of the Buddhist way of life and really at the heart of what the Buddha uh, taught, of what uh, Siddhartha Gautama taught. Uh, the first Noble Truth is a concept called Dukkha, or, or D-U-K-K-H-A, Dukkha. It is the truth that everyone suffers. That's the first Noble Truth. Everyone suffers. Right? Remember, he went out, he saw that suffering was, and his whole... Uh, Journey. His whole mission was to see how to escape suffering. So that's the first noble truth. Everyone suffers. According to tradition, Buddha said, and I quote, I have taught one thing and one thing only, dukkha and the cessation of dukkha. Um, that, that suffering is and how to get out of it. So th that's really what this whole worldview, this whole religion of Buddhism is really about. It's about the fact that there is suffering and how to escape it. If you really want to sum it up, that is what Buddhism is about. Uh, and this isn't just normal suffering that we think of in, in hearing the word suffering and like just hard times uh, that we go through. This really has to do with all of life. And seeing the truth that everything changes in this world such that even happy moments are ultimately unsatisfying because they, they pass away, they change, created things change. They don't last forever. Uh, Buddha taught as well that even those happy moments are a form of of suffering, uh, which means in, in, in that sense that all of life is suffering because there is no ultimate joy or ultimate happiness that we can find in, in creation itself. Uh, good, bad, or indifferent, nothing lasts, it fades away. Uh, we all, without exception, are subject to aging, sickness, and death. Um, which really, in, in, that, in seeing that perspective, other than God, I would agree. Other than, other than God, we do all in this fallen world change, and nothing in this creation is utterly satisfying. I think there's some common grace there that, uh, that the Buddha is able to see in that. But going along with this, uh, definitely wouldn't agree with this either. Uh, Buddha taught that nothing in the world is ultimately permanent, such that even the self, even our personal identity, uh, uh, our soul, uh, is not fixed or enduring. Uh, so, Buddhists don't believe in a soul, as we understand it. Now, this would go along with their, their monism that everything is of the same substance. Um, so, they don't believe that we actually individually have souls at all. Uh, the, the experience of us being separate beings and the fact that I am actually me and you are actually you is really an illusion. It's really an illusion because we're all a part of this, this one reality. Now, we do have minds, we do have consciousness, but we don't actually have an individual soul. And it is actually in holding on to this illusion of being a real, individual, permanent self that chains us to suffering. 
because we're constantly seeking to serve self and trying to find satisfaction for us. And so the more we hold on to this concept that I am actually an individual person in this reality, uh, the more I'm chained to suffering. <coughs> Which leads us to the second noble truth is it's the concept of Tana, T-A-N-H-A, and it is the understanding that there is a cause to our suffering. So the first noble truth is there is suffering. The second one is essentially there is a cause to our suffering. And the cause is associated with us desiring or craving things that cannot fully satisfy. Desiring or craving things that cannot fully satisfy, which is really the desiring or craving anything in existence. Because nothing can fully satisfy. So the cause of our suffering is an unhealthy craving for impermanent things and a constant thirst for self-gratification. Or a constant thirst for self-comfort. Holding on to the illusion that we are real, uh, that we are real individual souls, and trying to obtain things that we do not have for ourselves naturally leads to suffering, especially when we don't receive what we desire. So we suffer because essentially we're trying to accomplish something that can't be done in the, in the Buddhist worldview. We're trying to accomplish something that can't be done. We're trying to satisfy ourselves that really don't exist with things that cannot really satisfy. We're trying to satisfy ourselves that really don't exist with things that will never ultimately satisfy. Which leads to thirdly, this is the third noble truth, there is an end to our suffering. There is an end to our suffering. Uh, dukkha, suffering, will only cease when we experience the ending of tana, when we experience the ending of that unhealthy craving of impermanent things. When a person ceases from desire... Then he or she become one, becomes one with all. This is how you reach enlightenment. This is how you reach awakening. This is how you become uh, one with the Buddha. This is how you become free and truly liberated in uh, Buddhistic thought. Uh, you, you truly become awakened by embracing the fact that suffering is, that everything is impermanent including you, that you're not even real, you're just a part of this one reality, and then to cease from your satisfaction-seeking attachment to all reality. Stop trying to find your ultimate satisfaction in, in yourself, and in creation, and reality. This is how you ultimately become awakened by ceasing from this uh, search for satisfaction. Now, the ending to suffering is to detach ourselves from the thinking of doing anything to really gratify us. Uh, which is found in the following. It's found in the fourth noble truth, four, uh, the fourth noble truth, which is the middle way that I mentioned earlier, or the eightfold path. This is the way out of suffering. This is the way out of desire. Ultimate freedom from suffering is found in following Buddha's eightfold path, uh, also known as the middle way, which is essentially a series of moral, mental, and wisdom principles that we must learn to put into practice. So, the first uh, step of the Eightfold Path is right view or understanding. Right view or understanding. It means to accept Buddhist teaching and the Four Noble Truths and having a right view of life, uh, which is crucial to move forward. I must accept uh, what Buddha teaches in the Four Noble Truths in order to move forward. I need to have a right understanding. Uh, second in the Eightfold Path is right intention. Uh, I must have the right resolve to follow this path. To, to free myself from, uh, from lust and from ill will in, in this life. So I need to have a right intention on how I'm going about this. Uh, third is right speech. I need to be truthful. I don't need to speak in a vain way. Right? I, I need to be honest and so forth. Um, fourth is right action. I don't need to live in such a way that harms others. Uh, I need to be charitable in my life. I need to love others and so forth. Uh, the fifth in the Eightfold Path is right livelihood. Uh, I need to make sure that my habits and my day-to-day -day work is not bringing harm to others. I need to promote life in, in what I do. Uh, six is right effort. We need to focus our energy on the task at hand. Uh, what I'm doing, I, I need to be purely focused upon that thing so that I'm always bringing about the, uh, the right speech and the right action and the right livelihood towards that thing. 
So I need to have the right effort. My mind needs to be focused on whatever I'm doing in that situation that I'm in. Uh, number seven is right mindfulness. Uh, since ignorance is really our problem in suffering, we need to always pause and consider why we're doing what we're doing and whether it is harmful to ourselves or others. And then number eight is right concentration. So right view, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and then eight, right concentration, which is a dedication to right meditation. Uh, right meditation or chanting. Uh, we are to meditate and direct our minds towards awakening. We are to meditate and direct our minds towards seizing from desire in this creation so that we can then rightly proceed on our spiritual path. So that's why meditation is going to be a big deal in Buddhism and that we'll see next week in, in Hinduism as well because Buddhism really comes from uh, Hinduistic thought. Uh, but meditation is going to be a big deal because you need to direct your mind to think rightly and then follow through in your action rightly. So uh, they have a monistic worldview, and then we looked at the Four Noble Truths, and then thirdly is the concept of uh, what's called samsara, S-A-M-S-A-R-A, -S -S samsara, or which is essentially their view of the cycle of life. Their view of the cycle of life. Because Buddhism, as I said, does stem from Hinduism, it does similarly believe in concepts such as karma and reincarnation uh, and ultimately nirvana, uh, but they do have some differences in, from traditional Hindu thought on how those things are, are defined and how they work out. Uh, but the Buddha taught that apart from reaching enlightenment, our current lives now are just one instance in our samsara, uh, which is the cycle of birth, death, and rebirth. Birth, death, and then you know reincarnated into into something else. Uh, according to Buddha, we go through countless births and deaths until we reach enlightenment. So we'll go through reincarnation until we reach this state of being awakened and and ultimately uh, enter into nirvana. Uh, according to Buddhist teachings, we are reborn because of the same kinds of desires and attachments that cause us to suffer. Our consciousness is so powerful that even when the body dies, the mind continue, continues it, its clinging and searching for gratification. Uh, our mind, e even upon death, uh, our consciousness, uh, it, it continues to search for fulfillment and, and gratification and comfort. And in this way, according to Buddhism, it, it, it builds a bridge to another body. And trying to find fulfillment and trying to find gratification, it finds another body and takes birth again. Uh, to which where you're, you're reborn, where, when, and how you're reborn uh, depends on what you did in your previous life, uh, which is your karma. That is the concept of karma. Many people today, even professing Christians, say, I believe in karma. No, I hope you don't. Uh, that, that's, that's a pagan, Hinduistic, Buddhistic uh, worldview. Karma has to do with reincarnation, and the manner in which you're reincarnated is based on your previous life and how good you live. That's what karma teaches. Karma does not, you know, teach. I know what people mean when they say that, but that's not what it means. You know, people get what they deserve and so forth. Um, but that's what karma is. And, you know, you may be wondering that since they don't believe you have a soul, then what is it that, that is actually reincarnated? What is it that is actually uh, reborn? And that's why I said the consciousness or, or the mind seeks another body, because that's really the only thing that is reincarnated in Buddhism. Uh, that... That would be different from Hinduism because they do believe in a, in a soul. But uh, in Buddhism, it, it, it's really just your mind. It's really just your consciousness that, it's re, that is reborn. It's not actually individually you uh, that is reborn or reincarnated in Buddhism. It's just your mind that is reincarnated into a different body with a different personality and, and all that. Uh, which, you know, depending on your karma, will, will better help you or, or not help you to, to earn or attain your enlightenment. And until you do reach enlightenment, which is called nirvana, uh, this goes on and on and on and on and on, as I said. You live however many lives you, know, you need to live before you can attain this state. Uh, nirvana is a concept that is in both Buddhism and Hinduism. And while nirvana in Hinduism, it, we'll look into more, this more next week, uh, nirvana in Hinduism is about becoming one with the ultimate God reality uh, that's called Brahman. Uh, 
In Buddhism, nirvana is the ultimate escaping from all desire. Uh, the ultimate escaping from all desire. Once someone has become enlightened here on earth, as such, when they die, they break free from samsara, they break free from the cycle of life, from being you know, uh, reincarnated, uh, being, I was going to say born again, but not in the sense that we would understand that, being born physically again in this world. Um, because their conscious, and they are because their consciousness is no longer craving anything, and they go into nirvana. And this isn't just vivid, just vividly described in, in Buddhism. So I can't just tell you just you know what all this looks like and so forth. Uh, but it's it's essentially a never-ending state of really nothingness. Uh, if you just want to describe it, it's a, it's a never-ending state of nothingness. Uh, it's a never-ending condition of being free from all unhealthy desire. Uh, which in their worldview is a never-ending state of, of no suffering, of no stress. You're, you're just totally detached from everything. Uh, and and it's, a, it's a, an everlasting condition of, of no longer suffering anymore, no more stress. Uh, that is, to sum it up, the hope for the Buddhist. That is the hope for the Buddhist. So, just to come back... Um, a little bit and answer the fool according to his folly as we've been doing for the past worldviews. What do we say to this as Christians? What what do we say just to what we we just heard um, from the Buddhists? As those who have been given the grace to understand that Almighty God, our Creator, has has condescended uh, into His world to reveal truth to us in His Word. What do we say to these Buddhist claims? Well. There might be more that we can say that I'm going to bring out tonight. There, and if you can think of more to say, then, then praise God. Uh, let's, you know, use God's means to cast down every lofty opinion that raises itself up against the knowledge of God. So there might be more than, than what I'm going to say that could be brought out. But, but to the Buddhist claims, we should say this. Uh, firstly, and this is just very clear just from where it starts, this is a purely subjective world. This is all subjective. Um, this whole worldview is literally one man's opinion. It literally just comes from one man. It's just what one man thinks about the world. Uh, imagine if someone came to you and told you that you needed to start following this way of life, and then reasoning, their reasoning for this, really came down to that they're just getting this from their own experience. Uh, that this is really just their opinion. Should you accept that? No, no, you shouldn't. It's just their opinion. It's just their experience. It's, it, they're literally just saying what they think and what they feel. But what we think and what we feel does not parallel then into what is true uh, universally in the world we live in. Now, we are to accept truth, real, uh, objective truth that is true regardless of how I feel on any given day. Not someone's subjective opinion. And, you know, of course, someone, the Buddhist, the atheist, whatever, uh, someone may come back from that and say, well, I mean, how is that different from Christianity? Isn't that just your opinion? Isn't Christianity just your opinion? Uh, well, the answer is no. This isn't just my opinion. This is truth revealed from God in His Word. Uh, Buddhism and, and Christianity and how it is, is, is revealed as a worldview are on... Two totally different levels. They're, they're, really, they're not even the same thing at all. Um, what we have in Scripture is, is 66 different books, 40 different authors, written over a period of 1,500 years, all one consistent message because it's all been revealed to us by God. God literally breathed His Word through these men, through these authors, using them as, as pens in His hands, uh, if you will. And it's all one message. And, and who God reveals himself to be in his word is, is a transcendent creator, a, a personal God who speaks to us. He, he's not limited by anything. He lives outside of time. He's eternal. Uh, nothing limits him. And he has all knowledge. Uh, he, he's omniscient. He knows all things. He has ordained all things. Uh, nothing limits him. He, he's not contingent upon anything. Nothing frustrates him. And it's this God who lives outside of time, outside of reality, and gives life to the world, and gives truth to all things, who speaks nothing but truth. It's he who has is, who is condescended to reveal himself to us in, in his word, uh, to give us a right worldview, to have a justification for, for why we do anything. Um, and, and so that's very different 
than one imperfect man who doesn't know all things, who is limited, coming up and saying, I think you need to, to, to live this way. I think you need to follow this. That, those are two totally different things. Uh, this is all-knowing, omniscient God revealing himself, the God who knows all things, the God who knows truth, revealing himself in his word, revealing truth in his word. This is one man who doesn't know all things, who is limited, revealing an opinion. Could Buddha be wrong? Does Buddha know all things? No. Buddha could be wrong. I, in, my, in and of myself, if I have an opinion, I could be wrong. I don't know all things. And what I don't know in this world could contradict what I think I know in accordance with my own experience. But I can't be wrong if I'm basing what I know upon God, the transcendent God, who reveals truth in his word, objective truth that is true regardless of how I feel. So these are, these are two different things. Um, at the basis of this worldview, it's, it's, again, it's no different than someone down the street coming and tell, telling me that you know, he thinks we all need to follow this certain way. Hey guys, I had, I had this experience and I really think everybody needs to do this. Well, you know, what's your authority? What's your authority on why I should believe what you're saying? Are you literally telling me that it's just your experience on why I should believe you? Because you could be wrong about your experience. Uh, your experience is simply that. It's an experience, but it's not a declaration of truth. It's something that just happened to you, but that doesn't mean that it should happen to everyone across the board. So, firstly, I would want to ask the Buddhist why this should be accepted just purely based on the opinion of a mere man. Why should I believe what you believe since what you believe is just the opinion of a mere man? Because, well, ultimately it should. It should. Uh, and as image bearers of God, they know that. They've been created to know truth. They know they shouldn't just accept the opinion of someone. Secondly, I would want to bring up to the Buddhist, in a monistic world, how is anything bad? In a monistic world, how is anything evil at all. Uh, in, in a world where everything is the same, of the same substance, of the same reality, why is suffering bad? That's a question I want to answer. Why is suffering bad in this world where everything is just a different manifestation of the same thing? Uh, if everything is the same in reality and essentially has the same source, then by what standard is suffering even wrong in the first place? Because suffering, in that sense, is just a different manifestation of the same reality, just as non-suffering is. And there's really nothing, there, there's nothing to make a distinction between, oh, this is actually universally, objectively good, and this is wrong. Because everything is the same. Uh, in a monistic world, there is no standard. If there is no creator-creation distinction, and there is no transcendent lawgiver to... to show us objectively, tell us objectively what is right, what is wrong, this is bad, this is good, and, and we're really just a part of this big organism working together, then suffering is, is it simply, suffering is simply an all-moral experience, just as non-suffering is. All-moral meaning it's not moral at all. It, it's, it's just an experience, that's it. That's all it is. It's just an experience, but there is no truth in it. There, there is nothing in it. It, it is... Well, just as the Buddha says concerning the, that yourself is an illusion, it's, it's an illusion. It's, it's nothing. It's just an experience. It's just a circumstance. But there's nothing to say that it's good or bad because it's all coming from the same source. In such a worldview, circumstances are just things that happen. Uh, but without a creator, there is nothing to give it its purpose. So I would want to ask the Buddhists in their worldview, what is the point of accepting and following the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path? in a monistic world. What is the point of doing the what, what is the point of living your life in such a way in a monistic world? Where there is no distinction between anything, where there is no standard for morality. What does it matter whether you love your neighbor or not? What do any of these things matter? Why is suffering bad? Who says? Who 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 gives this meaning into it? Who gives this purpose into it? Because if they come back and say, Buddha, then now I'm, I'm, now I'm back to subjective reasoning again. Now I'm back to just an opinion. But who is the person who, who says whether this is good or bad? Ultimately, you have to come to the, the conclusion, if you're trying to somewhat be consistent in the worldview, that there isn't one. And then there isn't any purpose to life. Really, 
Buddhism should not be accepted based on, on that reasoning alone. Uh, it, it, it ultimately takes any truth and, and any good or bad outside or, or, and throws it away uh, outside of reality. So what? I said this religion sounds like a bunch of contradictions. Well, uh, you're, you're going to find a bunch of contradictions when you continue to suppress the truth of God. Right. Uh, the fool says in his heart there is no God. And that's a, that's a foolish uh, mindset. That's a foolish way of thinking. A, a foolish way of thinking is always going to be a, con a, a contradiction. Uh, because as the Proverbs say, the fool does what is right in his own eyes. Foolishness, subjection, or suppression of, of the truth of God always leads to a subjective worldview. It always leads to your own opinion. Um, and this, just as, as with their monism, it, it strips any meaning from all life at all. It strips any meaning because everything is essentially the same thing. There is no distinction, so it strips any meaning from all life at all. Um, does everybody understand what I mean when I say that? Does everybody get what I'm, what I'm getting at there? Yeah. Okay. Um, thirdly, so, you know, after pointing out, you know, it, it's, it's subjective, the, the monistic worldview makes no sense of the reality that we live in, and it really leads to just to nothingness. Thirdly, I would want to point out that though it may seem to the Buddhist like a good endeavor to deny yourself and seek the good of others in the Eightfold Path, at its basis, the worldview in that is completely selfish. It's completely selfish because the only reason you're really doing anything you're doing as a Buddhist is for who? Yourself. It's for you. It's not really for that person. It's for you. You deny yourself not because you actually love people and want the best for them, uh, not as Christianity because you love God and because you want to love God, you want to love neighbor. You don't want to seek your own interests, but you want to pour yourself out. You want to, you want to give yourself out to others. Uh, but in Buddhism, you deny yourself and serve others because you're really just trying to serve yourself. You're trying to attain your own enlightenment. You're trying to attain your own awakening. You're, you're doing it because you want to get something out of it. You're just trying to attain nirvana. Uh, this makes your whole life about you. Uh, which though they may have a, a, a Buddhist worldview, as an image bearer of God, they know that that's wrong. As an image bearer of God, created in God's image, they know that it's wrong to be, in their heart of hearts, they know that it's wrong to do, to do things just for themselves. Uh, and as an avenue to express the gospel to them, I would want to ask the Buddhists, why do you think it's okay for your life to really be all about you? Why do you think that that's okay? Uh, because that's extremely prideful, and it's contrary to who our God has created us to be and has shown himself to be in Christ who, who humbled himself and became a servant. Right? He did not think, uh, Philippians 2, he did not think equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he humbled himself, being born in the likeness of men, uh, becoming a servant, being found in human form. Uh, he, he humbled himself to the point of obedience, even death, to, to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him with a name that is above every name, so that at the, knee, at the name of Jesus Christ, every knee should bow, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Uh, Jesus Christ came and died a death he did not deserve to, to give himself out to service to the Father and service for his people, service for his church, his, his sheep. He poured himself out. He humbled himself. He didn't come just seeking his own will, but the will of him who sent him. The will of him who sent him was that he wouldn't lose any of all that he had, he had given him to give himself out for them. So I would want to bring that up, just the complete selfishness of the worldview. And that, that you know, why is it okay for you to do everything in your life for you? Uh, and then use that as an avenue to ultimately bring out the gospel. Because they know that that's not right. They know that that's not right. They, the way they've been created contradicts that. Uh, and then fourthly, uh, this is the last one that I have to bring up. I would definitely want to show common ground and that by God's common grace, I mentioned this before, they do see that there's a problem in the world. They do see that there's a problem. We live in a fallen world because of our sin and they see the suffering and, and that ultimately this creation will not uh, give ultimate satisfaction to us. That's true. The creation will not give ultimate satisfaction uh, to us. Uh, those who continue to reject God, those who con continue to uh, rebel and, and not find their life in the bread of life, 
They will never find life. They will never find true joy. They will never find true satisfaction because they're continually worshiping the creation and not the creator who is blessed forever. Uh, so that's true, but the problem is that they have totally sought to suppress the truth and throw God out of the window in this, and in doing so, obviously, their cure for suffering is extremely lacking. Uh, the cure isn't found in us. It's not found in us. It's not found in any created thing. It's found in the God they deny. It's found in the triune God of Scripture. It's found in God's grace in the Gospel. Uh, it's found in recreation, not reincarnation. It's found in recreation, not reincarnation. It's found in having a new heart given to you by the grace of God, becoming a new creation in Christ. Yet, similarly, it is found in rebirth, but not in the sense that they mean. Yes, you must be born again. You need a new heart to see that, yes, nothing in this creation will satisfy, and the only thing that will satisfy is the Lord your God, your Creator. In His presence, Psalm 1611, is the fullness of joy, and at His right hand are pleasures forevermore. You will find it in Him, but you will not find it in this creation. And to continue on the Buddhist path is to continue trying to find it in creation. So our desires do need to change, right? I, I'll agree with them. Our desires do need to change, uh, not to where we don't have them at all, but to where we desire right things in God's sight, uh, to where we desire Him and His glory and thus delight in doing His will. So we don't need to just cease from all desire, but our desires do need to change. They need to change to how God would have us desire things to desire Him rightly, and thus, from that desire, love and serve one another in living our lives in the way He has created us to. But, again, going along with, with the contrast from Buddhism to true religion to Christianity, we don't have the power to do that in and of ourselves. Buddhism says, you can do this. You got this. It's all about you. I mean, so much, I mean, they don't even, for the most part, don't even accept a God. Like I said, mostly they're atheistic or pantheistic. It's all about you. Um, and, and I did read a lot. That is why it, it is compelling for a lot of atheists. There are a lot of atheists that go into Buddhism just for that, that mere fact. It's like they're really just going into really nothing different. They're continuing to serve self. They're continuing to reject God and do what they want to do in accordance with their own desires. Um, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. The Word of God tells us you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. That's what we are. We are by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind, and we don't have the power to change our own nature. We don't have the power to do that. Uh, Jesus says in John 8, 34, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. That's, that's everyone. That's all of us. That's the Buddhists, regardless of the worldview that they're holding to. They've sinned in their life. They practice sin. They're a slave to sin. And a slave to sin cannot set himself free. That's why Jesus says that the Son must set you free. He says that His truth must set you free. Uh, before this, in John 8, 31, he says, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And he says, after saying that if you practice sin, that you're a slave to sin, he says in verse 36, So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. You, you must be set free by Christ. You must become a new creation by Christ. You need to submit yourself to the God you know, the God who has created you in His image, the God whom you've sinned against, the God whom you're accountable to, and the God who has commanded you to repent and trust in Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus, our Lord. Christ Jesus, who is the only one who can set you free from the desires you're seeking to set yourself free from in and of yourself. You can't do it. You can't do it, but Christ can. Amen. Christ can. And that should be the call to the Buddhists. Uh, really just as to anyone. Uh, that their desires do need to change, and the only one who can do that is Christ. Uh, he is the only one with the power to set you free. Uh, cling to Christ. Trust in Christ while God has given you time. 
Find in him all that you need. Uh, to the Buddhist, quit clinging to someone's subjective opinion. Quit holding on to a worldview that makes no sense whatsoever of the reality that we live in. That strips all meaning and all truth and all uh, justification for morality out of the world we live in. Quit doing things purely for yourself to obtain your own status. Quit doing all of these things and come to the truth. Come to the way, the truth, and the life. Humble yourself and come to the truth. Come to the Father. Trust yourself entirely to the Savior in whom we find all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Uh, become a new creation in Christ Jesus and worship and serve your Creator as you ought, as His image bearer. Uh, that concludes our, our look at Buddhism this evening. And as always, apart from any comments or questions, we can conclude in prayer.